Okay, here we go. Species interaction, right? And uh, community ecology, very much the fundamentals of any ecosystem and the species that uh, are in it. And so exciting. We're going to uh, lay the, the foundation for that. Uh, and we'll start there. What we're going to talk about for the most part um, in this first section is uh, the species interactions um, and, and discuss the different types of uh, interaction that takes place. And so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I love this picture here uh, of this beginning of a lake. Uh, it reminds me of so many lakes up in uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, even going up into the Upper Peninsula and uh, into Canada. But uh, it starts out with those low-lying wetland areas. And there's so many different interactions that are going on there. And, and then um, the, the ecosystem uh, gives way to the deeper uh, benthic areas and, and uh, uh, different type of ecosystem. So it's very exciting to see all the interactions. And, and you know, one of the big things is the question is, where does an ecosystem begin and end? Because uh, if you note, um, while it is not in the water, there are trees around the outside of this ecosystem and reeds and cattails and things like that. And, and uh, uh, there's definitely interaction between um, aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. And so um, very cool uh, topics, very cool things to talk about. Uh, so what I wanna do is start with uh, uh, a couple of, uh, of interesting thoughts. Uh, and this is really affecting um, Lake Michigan, uh, all the Great Lakes for that matter, um, uh, but it's starting to affect deeply uh, the Illinois River. Uh, and uh, it's made its way uh, into uh, even the Vermilion River and, and they're called zebra mussels. Zebra mussels are, are uh, uh, a shellfish, it's a, uh, a mussel that's really good at what it does. And, and so the question is, is, okay, what's the problem? Well, um, they are what's called an uh, um, invasive species. They have uh, come in to an area. In this case, what they did is they, they traveled on, on, uh, in ships. And um, these, these big vast ships have ballast uh, water in their holes. So in other words, they flood a portion of their hole so they sit deeper in the water and they're not rocking as much and, and the water in the hold um, basically uh, slows it and, and it reduces the amount of movement that it wants to do. And so they fill this water from wherever they're at. And in this case, um, Europe or, or anywhere for that matter. And when they come into um, the Great Lakes, and get to where they're going, they no longer need that ballast water. And so they discharge it. And when they do, um, sometimes there's uh, invasive species that are along it or are with it. And so in this case, zebra mussels have done um, quite a bit of damage to uh, the Great Lakes and, and beyond the fishing industry. But what do they do? They're very good at filtering water and that's what they do. And so when they do, they, they siphon out and filter out all the phytoplankton and zooplankton and, and outcompete other species, fish, uh, other, other mussels, that, you know, things like that. Uh, in fact, Lake Michigan went from a really dark navy blue, kind of like my sweatshirt, uh, a dark, darker color of blue. And now because of their filtering, uh, all of the, all of the material out of the water, it's actually, uh, uh, in, in areas a very much lighter blue because um, there's nothing reflecting the light back. And so, um, but what they do is they also clog up pipes and, and uh, uh, boats and all sorts of things. And again, uh, um, billions and billions of dollars have been um, lost to um, zebra mussels and the clogging of pipes and there's really no known predator for them. And so um, the only thing that we can do is prevent them or um, clean them off. Um, now, there are some now organisms that are feeding upon them 
uh, but but it's not to the point where we can do something with that. Um, Chicago, <laughs> more drain pipes have been clogged in Chicago due to zebra mussels than anywhere. And uh, and so it's it's really, really a, a, a dangerous thing, but this is the case of, a, a, of an invasive species coming in. Um, so, you know, the, we, we have some pretty simple interactions and um, we talk about interactions. Uh, organisms interacting is, is the backbone of everything that, that is um, out there. And so when you think about the different things, okay, we have competition. Well, we have competition between species of the same kind uh, and species of different organisms, right? So um, all sorts of things. Um, but a competition is when um, both are competing for a resource uh, of limited supply. Uh, predation, parasitism, parasitism herbivory, um, this is just basically the consumption uh, by one, where one benefits, the other is harmed. And then we have mutualism, which um, both benefit. And uh, there's quite a few examples of that. So what I wanna do is talk about competition first. Earlier, I discussed the fact, uh, I said competition uh, of a limiting resource. What are some limiting resources? Food, water, shelter, sunlight, uh, mates, uh, um, space, territory. Um, these are things that organisms need to survive. And, and so as a result of that, if they don't have these things, then um, it will decrease the reproductive success and maybe, maybe uh, um, cause, cause an organism to die, you know? And so um, these are very important things. Now, we have basically two different types of interaction when it comes to competition. We have intraspecific and interspecific. And the way I remember this is an intra, intra state uh, or an interstate, um, uh, the roads. When we talk about intra, uh, state trucking, we're talking about go, staying in one state, uh, and it holds true to the competition. We're dealing with the members of your same species. So two giraffes competing for uh, a female giraffe or, um, you know, uh, two, two penguins uh, competing for rocks uh, to build their nests. And so, um, there is intraspecific competition. Interspecific competition is we're dealing with multiple species, and and um, it, it could be uh, all sorts of different species uh, competing for that same limited resource. Um, competitive exclusion. This is kind of interesting, and so uh, basically, uh, a species comes in and excludes another species from. Uh, its resource. So in this diagram over here, uh, yellow bird uh, doing quite well. It seems to be able to use and utilize resources all over the tree. In comes red bird. Now red bird um, could be an invasive species. It could be just one that uh, has, has uh, migrated to an area. But what ends up happening is red bird being a bigger bird, uh, is dominating and out-competing uh, yellowbird. And so what happens is uh, yellowbird has to uh, get out of the way. And so basically um, they're avoiding competition with each other uh, by one excluding another from the resource. Um, if we think about coexistence, this is what most organisms do. They they find a way to, to be able to utilize resources together. They live side by side, sing kumbaya, have little marshmallows by the fire. Um, you know, it's just, they're all able to um, exist at a equilibrium uh, that is decided by all of them together. And so um, 
one area could be slightly different than other another area just to certain little pieces uh, or nuances of of resources that are available and so um coexistence is really what we want to see and uh uh everybody gets um what they need to live um so when we talk about a fundamental niche basically is what is it that you or an individual as a functioning individual fills in an ecosystem? So that would be its fundamental niche. Now, the problem is you can't just do it by yourself. And so there are multiple organisms or multiple species involved. And when we have um, other species involved, they are utilizing resources as well. And so what happens is you get what's called the realized niche. And that's, that's really what it is that the true role is being played with other species interacting. And so um, uh, slightly different, one is more realistic and that would say the realized niche is, is the realistic one. Fundamental is as if everything was gone, species by itself, what would it do? That's the fundamental niche. Resource partitioning is pretty cool. If you look at uh, uh, birds in particular, they do this really well. Um, you can see the white-breasted nuthatch here up on the left-hand side. It's called, do you guys remember the call? Wah, 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 right? So that was the call. Uh, and uh, the pileated woodpecker, yellow belly sapsucker, uh, and brown creeper on this tree, all utilizing different resources on the tree or different areas at different times. And, and so basically um, they're, not, um, they're not utilizing the same resources. And so as a result, they're all able to um, exist, right? So, um, you know, it just depends on, on which, which organism we're talking about, but obviously the wood white-breasted nuthatch eats insects yellow belly sap sucker, drink sap. So now all of a sudden you go, okay, those two don't interact at all. Maybe they sit next to each other, but they're not eating the same resource or consuming the same resource. Character displacement, when we talk about uh, different things, again, this is resource partitioning. Um, if you look at uh, the Galapagos finches, um, they're a prime example of how a species will evolve as a result of being able to utilize a food source. Now, um, beaks in the finches are uh, something that uh, allows them to outcompete other organisms. Um, and if a mutation has taken place to cause the beak to be able to utilize a different food source, then we see them able to change what they're eating. So in other words, um, there are a group of the finches that can uh, crack big seeds. And so they evolved larger bills to do so. Um, there are finches that uh, drink nectar. And so again, this way, they're not utilizing the same resource. And so they are petitioning, partitioning themselves um, by their genetics. So character displacement uh, allows them to be able to utilize different things. Um, predation, pretty, pretty straightforward, right? It's being able to consume another organism, uh, um, whether it's parasitism. Parasitism, one, oh, you have a host and you have uh, uh, a prey item, uh, um, so you have the parasite and the host. The host is basically um, not killed, but it's it's feeding off of it, right? So um, whether it's predator or prey, um, usually one's going to die, right? That's the whole idea. Uh, they're consuming another organism. Um, and then with herbivory, we're just simply eating plants. Now, we're going to talk about food webs and, and uh, food chains a little bit later, so I don't want to go too too far down the line on that. But um, 
as we are consuming other organisms, obviously um, energy is flowing uh, from the lower levels up. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Uh, effects of zebra mussels. I put this on here again. I, I wanted to show you this. This is a picture that I found on the internet that, that basically came out of Lake, Lake Michigan, but what are the zebra mussels doing? They're out competing other organisms for a resource. They're better than other organisms. If you think about uh, what they do, um, they are um, a filter feeder. And so as a result, uh, they try and position themselves. They can't go any far, uh, anywhere. So they, they put their, basically they're born um, and when they do, they find a, subsur a surface to attach to and they never move. That's where they stay. Well, eventually they build up, build up and build up and build up on top of each other to where um, tubes are clogged, uh, propellers don't work, may holds, holds of boats uh, are covered. And so um, again, they are becoming a bad, bad thing. Um, however, we are starting to see other organisms eat them not fast enough. And to go back, think about this. The, the fishing industry has been totally decimated by this. And so we have to be very careful. Uh, um, and they're, they're working hard to get this taken care of. Um, Predator-prey relationships. And I think this is kind of um, pretty cool textbooks type stuff, but it's, it's true. And what I want to point out is if you look at uh, the rabbit, the rabbit is in the blue line. The bobcat is in the red line. And so as the rabbit population goes up, uh, then now there are more food source for um, the bobcat. And so the bobcat population responds. But there's what we call a lag time. And so um, as the po population of bobcat cats go up because they're eating rabbits, now all of a sudden their population starts to fall when they're not getting enough rabbits. And then the rabbit population is like, hey, this is working out pretty good. And so they have more babies and away they go. And so you see this up and down responding uh, to each species. And uh, uh, it goes back and forth, which I, I think is uh, probably as textbook as it gets. The, the uh, bobcat and the rabbit or the lynx and the hare is a, a pretty classical approach. Um, natural selection, right? Uh, organisms have traits that are, allow them to survive better than others. Um, when we talk about natural selection, you know, the tenets of, hey, the environment contains things that kill. Uh, organisms have to have more uh, babies than can possibly survive. Uh, species has to out be able to outcompete. If it doesn't, bad things happen. And so when we talk about natural selection, um, you know, it's the adaptations of organisms to where, uh, you know, they, they say survival of the fittest. Um, well, what does it really, what does it really do? Well, organisms, uh, there are organisms that are less fit for survival than others. And the ones that have uh, better genetics, better stamina, better food sources, um, I mean, they're gonna reproduce and have babies. Um, and, and we think about kind of where things are at as far as uh, predator-prey relationships. Uh, wolves play an extremely important role in healthy ecosystems as top keystone predators, the, the predators who are driving the system. And, and what I think is pretty, pretty cool is um, if you think about what they do, wolves don't take the healthiest of healthy individuals. In fact, uh, uh, they look for ones that are sick, weak, um, not doing well, uh, young calves, old or, uh, members, and so what does that do? Well, um, the wolves are basically playing an essential role in a healthy population of whatever, whether it be deer or caribou or whatever. And so um, interestingly enough, 
we find that this relationship, predator-prey relationship, uh, is very important for maintaining uh, a healthy species of predator and prey. Um, and so um, it's, it's pretty cool uh, to watch. Um, living laboratory that, that just took place mm, not long, uh, I would say since 95, somewhere in there, um, is the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone and how, how really that and uh, Isle Royale up in, uh, up in the Great Lakes and then uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. But uh, really um, to see what role they play is really interesting. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, people were noticing that there, there, there weren't a lot of aspen um, in, in Yellowstone. In fact, the aspen is a tree, uh, Colorado aspen, Colorado, named after the aspen tree. Um, but all the aspens there were old, 80-year-olds and, and greater. And what was happening was um, that with the wolf gone, um, the moose and other, uh, um, the deer, the elk, the moose, they were eating all these young saplings of the aspen. And so aspen couldn't grow. And so the only thing that was left were the old trees. Um, and the beaver didn't have anything uh, that they could cut down because these aspens were really too large. And so the beaver population was a problem. So the wolf comes in, they reintroduce the wolf. And then all of a sudden it causes the uh, moose and caribou and elk herds to, to and deer herds to uh, have more manageable, better numbers, uh, better healthy offspring, better survival. Uh, but then what does it do? It increased, increased the saplings of, of the aspen in which then here come the beaver back. And so uh, the, the deer, the, the, the wolf uh, really plays a major role in a healthy ecosystem. And, and they learned this by reintroducing the wolf. Um, organisms, uh, organisms have ways of protecting themselves. Um, and so if it's other than teeth and, and whatever, or, or scent glands, or um, how about this? How about camouflage, right? Better yet, what about, hey, I don't want to camouflage. I want to let you know. So in nature, yellow, orange, black, um, you know, white, red, these are called death colors and it makes you stand out. And so this monarch butterfly here in the middle is saying, hey, you know, here I am, but before you do, I want you to remember me because you might eat me and die or you might just get sick, but either way, um, you're not going to be happy. Now, there are uh, organisms that mimic other organisms. So over here on the right, this caterpillar is trying to pretend that it's a snake. There are other butterflies that try to look like the monarch butterfly. Um, you know, viceroys, uh, even, uh, uh, even painted ladies, right? So it's not a conscious thing, but their color patterns have evolved that, hey, less organisms eat these color patterns because of the bad experience or whatever that they've had with eating a, a monarch butterfly. Um, so again, three cool different types um, of, of defense mechanisms that are involving coloration. Parasite, uh, actually the parasite and the host, right? So the host is the one that is being um, harmed. Usually don't kill them, right? So parasite would be like a tick on, on my uh, black lab or a tapeworm or um, all sorts of things. Uh, sea lampreys, like on this fish down here in the bottom corner, uh, this is a sea lamprey, a jawless fish, and it'll rasp a hole. You want to talk about scary movies this is it. And uh, they, they will, this is a, where some of those movies you thought were scary. 
he see lampreys rasp a hole in the side with their tongue and then they just hook to the side of the body and they feed crazy coevolution uh where one species evolves to another so i'll give you a good example brood parasites uh where you have the eurasian reed warbler now this is not a reed warbler chick what has happened is the common cuckoo has come in another bird kicked the reed warbler's eggs out laid its eggs in there and now it's forcing the reed warbler to um, raise its babies in fact uh, the common cuckoo doesn't even have a nest they don't build nests um, purple throated uh, uh, carib right uh, and so basically what it is is a hummingbird and uh, it is feeding from nectar of a flower but if you look at the flower the flower is actually curved to meet the beak of the hummingbird and what has happened is the hummingbird has evolved um, to be able to take advantage of this one of my favorite and as the ant and the acacia uh, um, the acacia is a tree acacia tree both bullthorn acacia and uh, the ants basically what they do um, the acacia tree provides sugar for the ants the ants protect the plant from being predated upon. And so these ants have a really nasty, nasty uh, sting when they bite and um, it, they'll actually kill other insects. And so the acacia tree is providing food to the ant and the ant is protecting the acacia tree. So they are, uh, in fact, the acacia tree has thorns on it and they have hollow openings in the thorns and the ants live inside the acacia thorns. Uh, when we were in Nairobi, uh, we got to see this firsthand and it was just stinking cool. I just, it was really cool. Um, herbivory, you guys are all smart enough. Organisms eating plants. Um, this happens whether it's uh, a cow or insects or whatever. Uh, there are many, many different types of plants that have uh, a chemical um, defense mechanism. And so when you think about the defenses, whether it's a physical defense mechanism and thorns or a chemical defense me mechanism that just tastes bad or makes you sick or whatever, um, herbivory, right? We're dealing with um, primary producers and they're being consumed by a primary consumer, right? So that would be um, this caterpillar. Mutualism, uh, I actually put this picture on here. This is the Ritter eye sea anemone. So it's the Ritter sea anemone. Um, anyhow, so uh, clownfish and sea anemone, they live together. The clownfish protects the sea anemone. The sea anemone uh, uh, provides a home uh, for the clownfish. Uh, and so uh, definitely a mutualistic uh, relationship. It's symbiotic. It's saying, hey, we're both interacting. We're both uh, getting something from this. You have a huge symbiosis with gut bacteria. And in fact, good uh, gut health is a big thing, right? Um, pollination, I, you know, bees, bats, birds, etc. They're getting food from these plants, and then they tr they transfer the pollen to another place. And so, um, for an exchange of some food, I will take your seeds to another plant, right? But there are other sources of pollinators, right? So. Um, butterflies, wasps, moths, people, right? The wind. So pollination is a huge thing. But when we're talking about um, two organisms, it's mutualism, right? Amensalism. Uh, this one's hard. I, 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 and I, I mean that I, very rarely do you see uh, a relationship where 
something is harmed and the other is unaffected. Uh, I, I just don't have a real good um, example of this amensalism um, just because usually something uh, benefits and something is harmed. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. It's just a hard one to do. Um, you know, when we think about uh, plants, I guess that would be, you know, one is harmed, the other doesn't benefit at all. Uh, it's just protecting itself. I don't know. Is it, I don't know. I put down here, is this competition, right? Uh, I don't know. Um, relationship where uh, one is affected and one isn't, but one has a positive effect, commensalism. And so this is a picture of me out in the ocean uh, when we were doing uh, our study on reef fish populations. And one of the fish that I caught uh, was this shark sucker. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a member of the Remora family. Uh, anyhow, on the top of its head, it's got this giant disc. And this disc um, basically inflates and then flattens out and creates a suction area. And so it's able to uh, attach to the bottom of a shark. Um, now, what does it get from it? Well, the shark doesn't get anything uh, from it, but when the shark feeds, then the shark sucker or the remora, and it's a shark sucker, um, then opens its mouth and it feeds on little chunks that the shark. Sharks are really not good at eating. And so it feeds on it. Um, and so one of the guys on the ship took and stuck this to my arm to show me how it worked. And I thought that was really, really cool. Left a giant hickey on my arm. All right. Um, facilitation. Uh, this is pretty, pretty easy. Uh, basically, an organism is uh, either creating shade or whatever. Um, this is what's called a nurse log. It's facilitating, this is the nurse log, these other trees and growing. And what happens is it falls down and then the organism provides nutrients and area for these other trees to grow. And so what you'll see is all these trees in a row that are living off the nutrients that came from the tree. In this case, it was a hemlock. Uh, community uh, basically is uh, all the organisms of, of different species living together at the same place at the same time. Okay, so they're all interacting. A community ecologist is somebody who studies that, just that simple. Uh, and, and what they're doing is they're trying to figure out what's going on, how they react to each other, what do they do, that type of thing. Um, if we look at energy and how it goes through different levels, uh, you heard me say this here earlier, producer. So the primary producer, this is the base of the chain. This is the base of the food pyramid. It goes primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. But all along, you have what's called decomposers and detritivores. And basically, these are the ones that break down all the crap. These are the... the um, ones that eat uh, and break things down, fungi, uh, annelids, which are worms, um, bacteria, uh, crayfish, things that eat and, and uh, they're the decomposers is what they are, right? They break stuff down. Primary producer, uh, some sort of plant or bacteria. Uh, primary consumer, that's whatever eats the primary producers. Secondary, they're eating the primary consumers. Tertiary, eating the secondary consumers. Now, at any point in time, this can all be broken down. And energy travels up the food pyramid or food chain uh, from the bottom up. And so you have to have a greater number of calories at the bottom to support the top. And anywhere where that's reduced, then you can you basically reduce the number of organisms that it can it can support. Um, autotroph, cell feeder, right? Plants, 
uh, bacterias. This is called uh, a chemoautotroph uh, or uh, chemosynthetic bacteria. Basically, basically, they're living off of geothermal uh, energy, uh, the hydrogen sulfide. Uh, in this case, these bacteria uh, are, are basically able to survive in different temperatures. Um, and so the cooler ones are able to survive out here uh, on the outside, which are red cyanobacteria. Uh, and then you have uh, the blue green bacteria can withstand hotter temperatures down here towards the middle, right? It's shallow, it's being cooled off by the air, it's being fed pretty much here. And so you have this, this coloration effect that's really cool. Uh, primary consumer, they're the ones on the very first level. They're eaten by, uh, I'm sorry, primary producer, ones on the first level, primary consumer, ones on the first level that eat primary producers. Secondary consumer, again, eats the primary consumer. Uh, it can also be a omnivore, so it could eat, also eat uh, producers as well. Just depends, omnivore uh, eats plants and animals. Herbivore eats only plants, right? Carnivore eats only meat. Tertiary consumer, I put this great horned owl. Oh, 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 right, there's another one for you. Uh, I'm sure you guys are laughing already. But uh, so tertiary is the top level consumer. We are a tertiary consumer, um, right? And usually uh, it's a larger organism. Uh, most tertiary consumers also uh, are K strategists and not R strategists. R strategists, remember, uh, rapid reproduction, smaller organism, don't care for their young. K, uh, they care for their young, uh, larger organism, only have a couple at a time, right? So uh, if we look at uh, uh, tertiary consumers, uh, this great horned owl, good example. Us, great example. It's very difficult in a food chain to be able to go greater than five levels because as you go up, right? So you've got the bacteria or the, uh, let's say grass, which is eaten by the mouse, which is eaten by the snake, which is eaten by the owl, which is eaten by maybe a coyote, which is eaten by, so we're at five, you know? So it's very difficult. Uh, detritivores, again, in decomposers, they break stuff down. Um, if we think about energy, right? So each time we go up the food chain, 90% um, of the calories are being um, uh, consumed. And uh, we, we only have 10% left. And 90% is used for pooping and peeing and walking and for us talking uh, or, or wolves making a call or nesting or whatever. 90% is being used and 10% is what's available for the next trophic level. And if you think uh, um, if you think about what happens, basically each time you go up, you, you decrease by a factor of 10 uh, 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 or 90%. Or and so um, as a result, uh, you've got to have a lot of energy on that bottom trophic level to support organisms above. And so... Um, if I use this analogy or this this question all the time, if we were to go to the moon, um, would we be better as vegetarians than than uh, omnivores? And the answer is is oh heck yeah, right? Because what happens is is the cow takes more resources uh, and loses more energy, or the goat or whatever organism that you're going to eat, uh, meat wise it loses 90% every time you go up that next chain. And so you need more and more of the plant to support the cow, to support you. And so really, um, as a vegetarian, you would be better able to survive, um, say on Mars. So here's a good example, right? So uh, primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. All right, well, we got a bunch of grass it can only support X 
you know, grasshoppers. And rodents need a lot of grasshoppers to survive. And if we don't have many, okay. And then same with hawks, right? And so um, as we go up in the food pyramid, we decrease um, the energy and, and with that biomass, right, organisms. Food chain, food web, um, this would be before, this would be a primary food web. So grasshopper, our food chain, uh, grasshopper eats the grass, rodent eats the grasshopper, hawk eats the rodent, that's a food chain. Food web, uh, all of the interactions that are going on and there's millions and millions of them. And so uh, this, is, this is terribly simplified. This, there's so many uh, millions of interactions that go on and so it's very difficult. But again, it's a visual representation of energy flowing through an ecosystem. Uh, you heard me mention this before, keystone species. A keystone species, uh, the wolf, uh, keystone like this in a doorway um, is what holds the door arch together. You pull it out, it crumbles like blocks. Well, again, if you get rid of, in this case, the sea otter, the sea otter is not taking care of, of other organisms that affect kelp. And so as a result, the, the mussels, uh, our sea urchins, I should say, eat the kelp, uh, whereas the sea otters were eating the sea urchins and keeping them in check. And so very, very important to uh, survival of an ecosystem are keystone species. Uh, trophic cascade. This is when we see the breakdown uh, of a trophic level. And so what happens, example, uh, we talked about wolves in Yellowstone. When we remove the wolves, and, and think about it. I mean, come on. We, we've done this for millions of years, you know. Uh, we've, we've really put a lot of scare into people on different species. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf, the big bad wolf? I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. We have demonized all these organisms. How about the role of the snake in the Bible in the, in the Garden of Eden? You know, um, we've, we've demonized so many organisms. And as a result of it, uh, people, people they, they're afraid of them. And so what do they do? They kill them. And so when uh, wolves were exterminated out of Yellowstone, what happened? Deer population increases. They overgraze the forest, uh, vegetation. Um, the aspens then go. The beavers go. I mean, it just, it just keeps going. And so really, when you think about it, all these organisms have a, uh, a niche uh, that, that they play and uh, a role. And so... Um, we have different types of disturbances that take place. Um, and most of the communities to a degree can resist change. They are very resistant despise, or despite anything that happens. And so, uh, but it's, it's repeated that it starts to break down. Um, most, or, most ecosystems will return uh, if disturbed back to its original state. And so they're in this constant back and forth, this ebb and flow. And so um, for us to be able to restore a lot of these communities, uh, while it takes energy, eventually nature will take over and, and do what it needs to do. Um, we have two types of succession, primary and secondary. Primary is when, uh, uh, by the way, succession uh, it is when we change an area, um, it's disturbed to some degree. And so when we disturb it, okay, if we take it all the way back to bare rock uh, to where all the vegetation and all the organisms are gone, um, in this case, glaciers, drying of lakes, volcanic activity, mm, landslides, you know, those types of things. Uh, when we take it back to bare rock, this is primary succession. Um, a pioneer species is this first species to come into an area. So most often a plant, right, a lichen, something small, and, and these are the first to start to break down to where they can build soil again. Secondary succession 
eh, okay, so we've come in, we've kind of um, dozed up the area. Um, there isn't an issue, but it doesn't go back to bare rock. And so wherever it's at, it just continues uh, to, to build from there. Now, ultimately, an ecosystem starts in primary succession, starts from the beginning, and we go from the grasses and herbs to the shrubs, to the saplings, to the pines, to the hardwoods. And this then becomes what we call a climax community. Climax community is the top level of succession. And these are like old growth forests, oceans, things like that. Uh, Frederick Clements, uh, really uh, very visionary when it comes to um, communities and ecosystems, basically said, hey, listen, um, ecosystems act as a cohesive unit and they share uh, limiting factors and, and uh, they are responsible for keeping an ecosystem intact. Now, Henry Gleason uh, basically says that, that an ecosystem is being maintained by species that are responding to their limiting factors. And so um, a species can come and go and other organisms will kind of fill that role without having too much issue uh, as far as the makeup of the, of the, of the community. Now, for me, it's kind of like flying an airplane. Um, I am sure you can fly an airplane and a nut or a bolt will be shaken, rattled out, vibrated out, whatever it is, and everything's still okay. You'll make it to your ending point. It's when you remove too many of those that you lose a wing <laughs> or an engine or whatever, right? So... Um, most of the ecologists believe that, yeah, things can come and go and it'll be okay. And so Henry Gleason is pretty much the school of thought. Uh, however, um, again, it's also a wide held belief that if you remove too many of the uh, organisms or species in a community, it will, it will collapse. Invasive species, again, I talked about this with the um, zebra, mo uh, zebra mussels um, coming into an area. Uh, how about the, the brown uh, ladybird beetles, right? Multicolored Asian ladybird beetles. Um, these guys, uh, they don't have natural predators. They bite really hard because they're made to wipe out aphids. And actually, they were brought here uh, to... Uh, work as a biological pest control of killing aphids didn't work. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's lots of different species out there uh, that are brought in as exotics, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally. Milfoil in most of our lakes, which is a uh, invasive species, comes in on the back of propellers from boats and really does uh, take over and change the ecosystem of, of ponds and lakes and things like that. Um, really, uh, there's a lot of crazy things. Out at, out at Humiston Woods, um, uh, uh, honeysuckle, uh, Japanese honeysuckle. Uh, um, I'm just trying to think. Oh, uh, wild garlic mustard. There's another one. Actually, wild garlic mustard is really good to eat. We should try that this spring. Uh, we'll talk about that later. It was actually brought as a food source and it's taken over. Uh, invasive mussels, I've already talked about. The zebra mussel, you can see um, where it was introduced was the Great Lakes and now it's made it all the way through uh, the Great Lakes. Uh, uh, the quagga mussel, again, is pretty much limited to the Great Lakes. Um, we do have a couple areas, but this again was ballast water. And what are they doing? They, they, they're filter feeders. Uh, they outcompete the plants. They outcompete the animals. They clog our drain pipes. Da, 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 da. Uh, how do we control invasive species? Well, find another species to eat them. Uh, okay. Physically remove them. Okay. Kill them with toxins. Okay. Um, there's, there's lots of different things. Uh, shocking them. 
Uh, this is a problem that we have right now with, with the Asian carp, right? And so we're trying to prevent the Asian carp from entering uh, the Great Lakes. That would destroy the fishing industry, ecosystems. Uh, so we have two electric barriers on the, on the Illinois River and uh, this Plains River uh, to keep, keep Asian carp from going through. And basically what happens, they fly through, they, they swim through the one electric gate, they get shocked and maybe they make it a little bit further and then they get come back and get shocked again and they float down. Um, but the other ones, the just in case barrier. So they, if they make it through the one and they're able to hang out and they recover, now they get it again. So, so far that's working. Um, uh, DNR just uh, a couple years ago did a, a sampling to see uh, if any other Asian carp had made it through. And so they did a count uh, to see if they could find something. They still haven't found that, uh, any that have made it through, but those electrical barriers, electrical dams make a really big uh, help in trying to prevent that. Uh, ecological restoration, right? So this is what we're trying to do out at the pollinator plot, returning an area to its previous conditions. Difficult, time consuming. Uh, yeah, we're learning that, right? Uh, what happens if we restore an area? Uh, it has huge implications. All of the organisms, uh, flora and fauna, so plants and animals, um, really has a huge impact. A great example of that would be the Florida Everglades, right? So they are trying to drain the Everglades because it was swamp. And then they realize, hmm, this is really important for us. And so um, because they tried to drain it, uh, they lost 90, 95% of shorebirds, you know, and it was, a, it was a tragic thing. They're just now trying to fix it, you know. Uh, this is like this all over the world. And we talk about biomes, right? So biomes or places are where they're at because of where they're at. And if we look at this, this map, a couple things stand out. Um, colors all seem to be in the same type of areas, right? Even if you don't know what the colors are. Well, what is going on here is these are different biomes. And it's based on a couple of things. Biomes are based on uh, uh, plants, and water and temperature, pretty much. And so when we think about um, those areas, they are based on those, those categories. And so if we look at the United States, an interesting thing, we can kind of start to see why things are where they're at. And so right here, we've got two sets of mountain ranges, the Sierra Nevadas and the Rocky Mountains, right? And so Water, when it's coming from the Pacific Ocean or wherever, um, water and clouds and rains, they have to get up over the mountains. And when they go up, they have to release their water. And so as a result, um, this water um, is released on the windward side of the mountain, which gives us an area that's drought right? It's, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of water. So as a result, now this area is quite arid. And then you've got the Gulf of Mexico down here, and it's pumping moisture right up in here into the breadbasket of America, which is where we're at. And so what I think is pretty interesting is geographic landform uh, really plays a major role uh, in where different things are. Look at Africa. It's such a large, large continent. And so any water that's trying to make it across this, uh, going from west to east, it's going to have a difficult time. And so this entire area is dry. It's arid uh, as a result of some things like uh, some mountains and some different, different areas. Here's an area of of the continent of Africa, this tropical, tropical dry forest, right? So um, really temperature, right? So we see temperature up here in the tundra and taiga. Um, ecosystems, right? 
biomes. Um, how are biomes determined? Well, temperature and water. Those are the two big ones. Other things happen, right? So soil is a big player, but really temperature and water and everything else kind of puts it together. And so um, this is really kind of a, a biome map, if you will. Uh, climatograph is what I'm talking about and showing, you know, where are we at with how much rain, how much sunlight, how much temperature, and what organism and species go there. Uh, aquatic, aquatic ecosystems are just like anything else, right? So um, they have herbivores and omnivores and carnivores and um, obviously sunlight plays a major role in this. And, and so ecosystems, basically you're either in the sunlit ecosystem or the literal zone or the benthic ecosystem in, in the, the darker areas. And we'll talk about that more. Um, talking about uh, forests, uh, we have the deciduous forest. We're a temperate deciduous forest, right? So that's us. Um, normal temperatures, uh, pretty much our temperatures, our amount of moisture, right? So we are a temperate deciduous forest. The leaves fall off the trees. Now, it doesn't mean all of them. We have coniferous trees, uh, but temperate deciduous. Temperate grassland, this would be a prairie. This would be a steppe. This would be a pampas. Um, this is drier conditions, mostly grass. We see this mm, in parts of Illinois, you know, so we're that prairie state. Uh, temperate rainforest, this would be the Pacific Northwest, right? And so uh, this would be Seattle, Oregon, Washington, uh, uh, parts of California, right? We've got a lot of moisture, warmer temperatures, uh, very, very humid. Tropical rainforest, very humid, hot temperatures. Uh, I, that's why I love to watch these TV shows. They got Indiana on Indiana Jones on there, and he has no sweat stains on his shirt. Probably not true. <laughs> it's hot. It's humid. It's wet all the time. Uh, tropical dry forest. This would be like Africa, right? Not a lot of moisture, a lot of heat. Um, they do have wet periods, though. They have they have wet pe periods that that a lot of rain comes down in one one moment and then it's over. Savannah, again, uh, this is a grassland, warmer temperatures. Uh, this would be in South America, Africa, Australia. Desert, uh, most continents have a desert and we also have one. Um, again, dry areas, little amounts of moisture. Um, we actually have cold deserts too. So tundra, um, tundra would be an example like cold desert. Um, not a lot of precipitation, very cold. Uh, boreal forest, we, we refer to them as a taiga. Um, again, we see moisture, um, we see uh, cold climate, shorter summers. This would be like uh, Alaska. Chaparral, again, this is a um, wet, mild type winter, spring, um, and drier, uh, drier summers, warm. Um, altitude, as we go up in altitude, we decrease in temperature. And so what happens is as we decrease in temperature, um, it changes the ecosystems until you get to what's called the tree line, which the tree line is trees no longer grow because it's too high in altitude. And so I think you lose, uh, I think it's three degrees Celsius. I think it's three degrees every thousand feet. Something like that. I, I can't remember the exact number. Basically, as you go up, you're losing temperature, right? So if you're in Denver, mile high, 5,280 feet, yeah, 
it's colder than if you're in Pontiac, Illinois. So basically the conclusion is, is this, all ecosystems have interactions and organisms that are going back and forth. And it's those interactions that really define what an area is. That too, there's one species that really has and plays the largest effect and that's us. And hopefully we can make some changes and do some things differently. Uh, but we are the organism that really has the greatest effect and survival of the fittest natural selection doesn't really apply to us. Um, we have used technology to get away from that. So um, we, we need to undo what we have done. So I appreciate you guys so much. You guys are awesome. I can't say thank you enough. Uh, I think um, everything you do matters and you matter. And I'm thankful uh, to be able to, to have each of you in class and I appreciate you. So hope you have a great day. Uh, thanks again for all you do to make an impact and keep on making it happen. You guys are awesome.